Welcome in beautiful Maastricht on this nice day. And here I, uh, hereby I open this session. Hereby I open this academic ceremony in which Samantha Lisa Kranz will defend the academic thesis Understanding the Social Side of Learning on the Role of Learning Climate for Informal Learning and Employability. May I invite you, Samantha, to present a summary of your study and the conclusion of your thesis in about 15 minutes. Thank you, Pro-Rector. Dear Pro-Rector, members of the Defense Committee, dear family, friends, and colleagues, I am beyond excited to finally present my dissertation entitled Understanding the Social Side of Learning on the Role of Learning Climate for Informal Learning and Employability. In the next 15 minutes, I will present an overview of my research, but I first would like to start with something personal. Many of you know that next to being a researcher, I'm also a sports instructor teaching various sports classes at Hume Sports, which is the university's sports department, for many years now. And I've been teaching um, various classes, different types of classes, and I develop a set of teaching skills. I was happily doing that back in 2020, when all of a sudden the pandemic hit, and we went from changing or teaching to 60 people in our classes to teaching online on social media via live streams. And here you can see a screenshot of me and my colleagues uh, teaching from our own homes with the materials and equipment that we had at the time. Um, and this highlights that the way that we did our job changed all of a sudden. So we had to adapt to that change. We had to adapt to online teaching and we developed digital skills that we didn't really use before but we're really new in this uh, environment. Luckily, we succeeded. Um, with this personal example, I hope to illustrate that change in our work is inevitable. And as a consequence, the skills needed to perform our work are constantly changing and ever evolving. The skills that we use now may change or maybe even become obsolete in the not so far away future. And that is why it's important to keep developing the skills and competences needed to perform our work, but also helps us to anticipate and act upon changes that we can expect in our work. And that way we become and remain employable. And in this dissertation, I refer to employability as the continuous fulfilling, acquiring, and creating of work through the optimal use of competences. We can identify several employability competences. If I draw back to the uh, example that I just gave, uh, my colleagues and I had the knowledge and skills to teach, but we had to teach in a different environment. So we had to adapt and uh, develop new skills. So we adapted to changes in our work, um, and should another pandemic hit, let's hope not so, we are able to um, well, prepare for that optimally and go back to online teaching if we need to. And there was also a sense of belonging to the organizations. We really cared for the organizations. We will really wanted to help UM Sports and our participants um, well, in, in joining our classes online. Now, organizations want employees who are employable throughout their entire career, in whatever circumstances. Not only in times of pandemics, but also in times of war, global warming, or even just changes in the market or society. Not only today or tomorrow, but for the rest of our careers. And to be employable for a lifelong, we cry as learning. And it's no surprise that many organizations invest in L&D, learning and development practices, but the question is, how do we learn exactly, and how can organization foster learning? Now, research shows us that uh, particularly informal learning at work uh, may play an important role in competence development and employability. 
And if we think about our work, we probably realize that there are a lot of social interactions in our work, right? So we present our work, we work with team uh, members, um, we engage in discussions, we ask for feedback, for example. So those social interactions are really embedded in work. Hence, the focus of my dissertation is on social informal learning, which is defined as learning from others involving the interaction with uh, peers, colleagues, supervisors, and clients, such as asking for feedback, observing, discussing, working with clients. Now, if uh, well, given that social informal learning is characterized by those social interactions, it is also highly dependent on the context in which those social interactions take place. This dissertation looks into unraveling that context, and then specifically a context that supports learning, namely learning climate. And we define learning climate in this dissertation as the professional's perceptions uh, of whether the organization provides the necessary conditions to promote, support, and reward learning efforts. And we can identify different building blocks, but I will, given the time, not go into detail in all those uh, building blocks, but I will highlight two, because these were also relevant in my research, starting with learning leadership. So having a leader who supports your professional growth and also helps with your professional development. And secondly, individual responsibility and autonomy. Granting uh, professionals the responsibility and autonomy to perform their work, but also to learn accordingly. Now, in order to help professionals develop the, uh, or their employability competences, we need to understand how professionals learn socially and how social informal learning can be supported. So these three concepts were central to my research, learning climate, social informal learning, and employability. I conducted four studies to investigate this in more detail. Study one, explore the relationship between learning climate, social informal learning, and employability. Study two focused on unraveling uh, the two concepts that we thought were drivers for employability, namely learning climate and social informal learning. In study three, we zoomed in partially based on the results of study two uh, and looked into learning leadership as one of the fundamental building blocks of learning climate and uh, looking into feedback seeking as a proactive social informal learning activity. And then finally, study four, we uh, developed and validated a questionnaire uh, measuring the proactive social informal learning. I will quickly um, list the key findings of my studies. So in study one, um, exploring the relationship. So does a relationship exist? Um, because if a relationship exists, it would be worthwhile to investigate these concepts in more detail and also the dynamics between the concepts. So we collected data via surveys uh, among professionals working in Dutch governmental institutes, and we showed or we found that the uh, participants, um, when they experienced a supportive learning environment, that they were more likely to engage in proactive social informal learning, and that that in turn uh, was related to higher scores on their employability competences. So these results indeed confirmed our hypothesis that uh, learning climate and proactive social, or, yeah, social informal learning were important drivers for employability. And that inspired us to investigate um, these two concepts in more detail in the following studies. Now in study two, I decided to further unravel social informal learning and learning climate. And we interviewed consultants and asked them to think about something that they've learned in the past few weeks how they learned it, and um, which factors helped uh, their learning. And we first saw that if we look at social informal learning, that these consultants engaged in many learning activities, which I categorized in proactive, passive, and collaborative learning. Proactive, for example, seeking feedback, passive, uh, observing other people, and collaborative, engaging in discussions or in teamwork. We also ask about their intentionality of learning, and the uh, consultants in the study mainly learn deliberative, so on purpose, planned, conscious, and reactive in response to a challenge or to uh, a problem at hand, and to a far lesser extent, implicit learning. And they mainly learn from their close circle, so their direct colleagues, the people that they're working with, and their project managers as well. 
Now turning to the relationship between learning climate and social informed learning, so how can that type of learning be stimulated? Um, we found that uh, granting responsibility and autonomy was particularly relevant for these social informal learning activities. Um, so also choosing what, how and when to learn in order to perform your work and learning leadership. So having a, a leader who supports your professional growth and helps you in that as well. In study three, we decided to zoom in even more. And given that in study two, learning leadership was one of the fundamental uh, yeah, building blocks of learning climate that we wanted to tackle. Um, so we looked into learning leadership and feedback seeking as a proactive social informal learning activity, um, given, uh, presumably because it would contribute uh, to uh, professionals' growth, given the evaluative component, seeking feedback, asking about how you are performing and if you can improve your behavior. And in this study, we uh, made a distinction between the method of seeking feedback, the frequency with, we, with which feedback is sought, and the use of the feedback as well. We um, used surveys and interviews to collect the data, and we found that um, Leaders who support employee development play a particular role uh, when it comes to using the feedback, also when uh, you are seeking for feedback, so the frequency, but more so the use of it. And that um, providing developmental and emotional support as a leader was related to directly asking for feedback and also giving more background information when you are searching for feedback. Well, um, while study one uh, inspired us to look into learning climate and social informal learning in more detail in studies two and three, uh, it simultaneously also inspired us to look into how informal learning is being measured. Um, so that's why in study four, we developed and validated the proactive social informal learning uh, scale or questionnaire looking into uh, feedback, help and information seeking and specifically also the frequency and the use, because if you're looking for feedback, that does not necessarily imply that you're also going to use it and learn from it. So this is an instrument that tried to capture that distinction as well. Key findings of this dissertation, um, having a supportive learning environment is related to more engagement in social informal learning, which in turn is more related to higher levels of com uh, employability competences. If we look at social informal learning, there's a wide range of learning activities that we can undertake. Um, and we see that there are proactive, passive, collaborative learning activities, and that we can engage in learning in a deliberative, reactive, or implicit manner. And for learning climate, um, based on the findings, I'd say that individual responsibility and autonomy, as well as leadership, are important factors. What does this all mean? What can we do as learners, as leaders, as organizations to foster professional growth and to foster employability? Well, for the, le for the learners, and I think that holds uh, for every one of us here present, um, it's most important, in my opinion, to realize that there are many ways to learn, to engage in learning, and to work on your own development. For example, engage in feedback seeking from your manager. Seek help from colleagues when you encounter a challenge or a problem and engage in teamwork. For the leaders among us, you have a pivotal role when it comes not only to professional performance, but also to professional growth. And a way to facilitate and support that professional growth is to engage in leadership behaviors. Uh, give feedback, be a coach for your uh, employees and your team members, coach for professional development, encourage social interactions if you know that social interactions are really embedded in a work and a way that we learn, and invest in a nurturing professional relationship. And for organizations, um, organizations can indirectly impact the way that we learn invest in learning climate dimensions, and based on the findings, I would say give professionals the responsibility to perform their work and to learn in order to perform their e work even better, and invest in leadership development with a particular focus on professional growth. So not only on performance, not only on managing, but also on leadership. 
Now, ultimately, learning can take place anywhere, anytime, and my research shows that context matters. So if you want to foster professional growth and employability, we need a climate that instills and encourages learning. Thank you for your attention. I hand back over the word to the Pro-Rector. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. The opposition will be opened by uh, Professor Gijselaars. Professor Gijselaars is Professor in Education Sciences at Maastricht University, and he is the chair of the assessment committee of this thesis. Thank you, dear chairman. Dear candidate, dear Samantha, first of all, I want to congratulate you on your dissertation. And as I said before, I truly enjoyed reading this beautifully crafted manuscript. That's one. But even more importantly, I also loved the way you organized your studies and the way you did your analysis and so forth. So it was a smooth read for me. And um, my, my question is uh, about basically about the generalizability of your research and the implications of your research. Now, going to the generalizability first. When, when you start reading in chapter two, your structural equation model is very clear. It says environment matters. So the model would say on the left, the learning climate, learning climate determines the way people develop their employability competencies. And basically, what you're doing throughout your studies in chapters three and four is you're constantly con drawing the concluding, and I'm quoting you literally now. It says in chapter three, learning climate seems to have a pivotal role for employees' social formal and learning, uh, informal learning. So, point proven. Yes, environment matters. Chapter four says, supervisors have a pivotal role in employees' development, so environment matters. So I was quite, so it looks like your, your theory is holding across different settings. So I was just wondering in chapter five, then probably she's going to test her theory, with the theory <laughs> which says environment matters. And to my surprise, what you're doing in study four is that basically you're crafting a new instrument, you're running all the tests, but the test is basically focusing on the dimensionality of your instrument, and it, it looks like it's not giving that much weight to how settings may differ. So that implies, in my view, that your instrument would work for academics, but also for people working at a manufacturing plant, yet you don't test it you're much more interested in the structure of your instrument without you know, analyzing whether settings differ in the way they might determine your findings in terms of uh, environment goes to employability. So my first question is, wouldn't it have been much more obvious in your study in chapter five to go in more in depth on what drives or what distinguishes different settings, given your theory that the environment matters? And my second question is, if indeed environment matters like you're saying, and knowing that you have been working at the Leadership Academy, then why is it that the Leadership Academy puts so much energy in training the academics and seems to ignore the importance of environment? And I'm quoting you literally from your, your uh, chapter six, where you are in stressing the importance of strategic human resource development and where you're saying policies can serve as a set of company values that applies to every professional. So that's all over in terms of the way you are generalizing your findings. But it looks like we're having a unit in our own organization which goes all the other way around. And you have been working there. So I would love to know what your view is now that you've done the work with your PhD and what you would advise you on. So my first question is about the generalizability and the second is about the implications. Yeah. Highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your compliments and your kind works, uh, words um, and for your interesting two questions. Uh, and I'd like to first start out with the second one, um, if that is okay. Um, why do we as a leadership academy invest in formal learning while well, I say, and, and um, the research also shows, that the environment context matters and informal learning matters? Um, we, um, gathering my th uh, thoughts, collecting my thoughts, um, we were brainstorming about how we can 
implement and foster informal learning. Um, and we thought that uh, building on uh, leadership programs, which are of course formal in, by nature, but including informal learning um, elements, um, elements that can also be related to the way that people learn, social informal learning, but also the climate, the environment in which that learning in that leadership prog program takes place. We wanted to incorporate that um, as well. So in a way, we, although we know that formal learning uh, contributes to some extent to comp competence development and employability, um, we also think that is an opportunity to uh, encourage more informal learning by building the curriculum around uh, elements that um, encourage employees, for example, to engage in feedback from their peers in that environment or to ask for feedback from uh, a direct colleague who was not in uh, that specific program um, or asking help from your leader if you want to apply the knowledge and competences that you've built and learned about in that program into practice. Um, so in that sense, yes, we focused on, in the Leadership Academy, on building leadership programs, more formal oriented learning, but we did try to uh, in, include elements that um, would foster informal learning at work as well. Um, and I think it also um, helps to build uh, a community an environment for the people who are joining that, that program um, or those programs to, um, uh, if they, they, they face challenges, they can ask each other as well outside of the formal program and the setting there. Um, but you can also think of, for example, events that the Leadership Academy try to organize, uh, bringing together different leaders um, to stimulate discussions and interactions in a different setting. Um, so I think that would be part of, the question, uh, part of the answer to that question, but I also think that there's an entire challenge that, that the university faces. Um, and then I'm also thinking about if context matters, the university is really big, we know that there are many faculties, many departments, and that the environment in which learning is stimulated or supported may vary across departments and teams units and faculties. So I think that there's also something that we are not necessarily able to tap into more specifically with the programs, but um, yeah, it would be something for my colleagues to work uh, on in the, in the future. That is part, uh, well, that's my answer to question two. Yeah, that's a clear answer. Okay. And, and, and now I'm waiting. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm old, I seem to forget several things, but I, I don't forget I asked another question. That's another question. question. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and referring to your first question um, on generalizability, I make bold statements. Uh, that is true. Uh, and I, I included different samples because uh, this is cross-sectional uh, cross sectional research. Um, and by including different samples, I try to see if, if um, my theory about learning climate and social informal learning would hold in different settings. It's not measured in the same way, no. Um, but there is a direction that, that professionals in different organizations perceive um, yeah, learning as something that is social and that environment indeed factors in, plays a role. Um, and then your question was also related to study four, yes. the questionnaire. I'm, I'm coming to the answer. <laughs> um, why I focus on the development and the structure of, of that instrument and not on the uh, applicability of that instrument in different samples, right? In different yeah. Uh, yeah. organizations, industries. Um, yeah, we, we focused mainly on the structure because we wanted to disentangle if frequency and use of social informal learning uh, is a distinction that we should make. Because many instruments measuring informal learning uh, or workplace learning looked into how often do you engage in. Um, but that does not necessarily apply that, that the information that has been sought, for example, is also being used. And we know from feedback-seeking literature that there's an entire process 
on uh, um, seeking feedback, determining whether the quality is fitting uh, for several reasons and characteristics. If yes, then I'm going to use it as well. So we tried to apply that perspective in study four, and that was mainly the focus of, of that study. Um, I also cross-validated in, in a different sample. So I um, validated as uh, in, in educational sector and in the business sector, um, reached metric invariance, not scalar invariance, if you want to reach or want to be able to draw conclusions between differences in teams or groups or um, organizations or types of workers as well, then scalar invariance should be um, reached as well. Okay. But that was outside of the scope of study okay. four. Thank you very much. That helps a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Gijslaas. The opposition will be continued by Professor Poel. Professor Poel is uh, Professor of Human Resource Development at Tilburg University, and Professor Poel is member of the Assessment Committee of this thesis. Thank you, Mr. Prorector. Uh, dear candidate, I would also like to start by extending my uh, congratulations for a fine written thesis, but of course today my role is to ask you nasty questions which I will happily do. I also have two questions, um, and in this, um, um, in this one, the, the second question depends on your answer to the first one, which is on social learning. The second one will be about learning climate, especially the conceptualizations that you use. So in the first um, instance, I would like to talk about uh, social learning, social informal learning. And I was wondering when I read uh, what you had to say about um, that notion, is learning not an inherently social um, uh, effort? Um, your, your examples are obvious, of course, if you interact with your colleagues, with your boss, with your clients, with any person that is social. But even if you read a book, you could say you're interacting with the writer of the book, huh? if you use um, in a way. If you go to a website, you interact with the designers uh, or the content people of the website. If you use any tool, you interact with the people who designed that tool. So from that perspective, I would challenge you to convince me that it is not the case that all learning is social. What would you say to that? Highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your compliments and kind words and for your interesting first question, um, which I will try to answer. Um, so just checking if I understood correctly, uh, your question is, is it not the case that um, all, all, all learning is inherently social? Yes and you asked me to convince you that it's not the case. Yes, because you put social in front of learning, and I'm wondering to what extent that has an added value. Yeah. That's a really good question. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you think about context and environment, there are always people involved, right? That's, uh, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think it depends on the type of interaction that you're looking into. Um, I am not, for example, if I would searching would search a website or information on a website, I will not ask the developer, hey, can you show me where I can find this particular type of piece of information? I will um, actively, proactively search for it myself and then think about whether it's useful, yes or no, and then going to use it. So in that sense, I think that um, I think it highly depends on the degree to which social interactions are really taking place. Um, if, yeah, and how you define social interaction and social learning. Mm -hmm. um, but, but given the fact that work is really built upon uh, yeah, social interactions and the other way around, social interactions embedded in work, um, that for me was a reason to really focus on social informal learning. Mm -hmm. Okay, so basically you are saying there are degrees to the extent of um, yeah, what, what shape the social interactions yeah. take, and they might be more or less social yeah. in a way, or yeah. mediated in different ways. Okay, that's, that's a nice answer to set up my second one, uh, which is on learning climate. Um, so the way I understand your conceptualization of learning climate, as you have it in uh, chapter two and three, and in one of the propositions you talk about a, a warm a learning climate, um, it, it's, it, tells, it tells me that um, it, it looks at the, the building blocks that should be in place for people to feel uh, supported to engage in learning. 
that seems to be a sort of also um, a, a grade of learning or a degree of learning that can uh, happen or a degree to which uh, such a uh, learning climate can be present, uh, which makes sense in itself, but um, it's also quite general and perhaps a little bit basic. So um, it sounds as if, if these building blocks are in place, and you sort of show that also in your empirical work, then the learning will happen. But I think that learning happens in all organizations, and it also depends a lot on the type of organization. Mm -hmm. uh, context matters. So um, I didn't see any references in your um, uh, dissertation to the learning network uh, theory. But um, one of my colleagues when I was still at Nijmegen, uh, Mirjam Baars, or then known as Mirjam van Morsel, wrote a dissertation on, on learning climate where she had a more organizational-based view of learning climate, which uh, she says is what you can see people find relevant when it comes to learning in different organizations. And if you, for instance, take a small real estate agency or uh, an internet startup or a cookie factory or a university hospital, you can imagine that the people who work there learn in very different ways about very different things, and also different things are um, relevant in those organizations. So for instance, in the real estate agency, um, individual responsibility of the real estate agents would, would be a very much cherished um, thing in the learning climate. Mm -hmm. When it comes to the cookie factory, the assembly line, it's very important that people follow the procedures that, that are in place. If they go outside that, they, they have a problem. Uh, the internet startup will probably put a bonus on creativity. Um, medical doctors in the university hospital have to adhere to the professional norms, but they also want to develop the insights that the profession has in, in their particular field. So it depends a lot what is found important or relevant in an organization or an organization type. And obviously, there could be combinations of these. So I would argue that that is a much context richer view than the six building blocks that you come up with. What do you think of this conceptualization and why would you think that your more general conceptualization is, is a better one? Yeah. Um, of course, I've, I thought about other, other contextual factors that could factor in, in, in learning. Um, we chose learning climate because it measures the pr professional's perceptions of whether they think that building blocks are present, yes or no, and to what degree that helps them in their learning. Um, to further just unravel on that individual level, how do we learn firstly to become employable and how does those factors uh, play a role in, in, in that type of learning? What I did not look into specifically was indeed the context, the nature of work or the nature of the organization. So for example, in study two, uh, in which I interviewed consultants there, we got more qualitative or yeah, data um, um, not necessarily related to the uh, analysis that I did, but we heard from the consultants that they were working in a fast pace and a constantly changing project team, um, hitting the deadlines and wor working with clients. So that was a different uh, environment than indeed the example that you gave about the uh, workers working on a cookie line, for example. Um, so that is still something, um, and there's also a side note. So I, I, the results, I do think that learning climate is important, but in this particular study, then individual responsibility and autonomy to help do your work, um, perform well, uh, do it within a certain timeline. But there was also a culture of learning there, uh, or not necessarily a culture, but uh, learning was really encouraged there in that environment. And that led those um, uh, employees and consultants to engage in that learning more proactively. But I can imagine that there are settings, um, for example, also blue collar workers, who are not necessarily aware of the, the, the way that they can learn and how an organization can help that. And then we can think about, for example, the, the employee working at a cookie line who is following the procedures, but finds a mistake in the handling procedure, for example, ask colleagues, hey, um, did you notice that as well? Do, do we need to report that to our uh, leader or our manager or supervisor? Um, yes, I think so. Well, uh, giving feedback to the leader, for example, and then in that way learning together and adjusting the work. So I do think that context, like I stated the entire time, matters. Uh, but we didn't look into the specific, um, the specifics such as 
the nature of work or um, how the organization as a whole looks at performance versus learning, for example. I, okay. Well, if I could do more research, then that would be <laughs> another <laughs> I, line I hope you that will. I would set out. Thank you for the answer. Okay. Thank you, Professor Poel. The opposition will be continued by Professor Raamdonk. Uh, professor Raamdonk is Professor in Adult Education at the uh, Université Catholique de Louvain-la-Neuve. And Professor Ramdong was member of the assessment committee of this thesis. Thank you. Um, dear Samantha, thank you for having had the opportunity to read your dissertation. I have read it with great uh, pleasure. It is fluent to read and well written, and it also focuses upon a subject which is very relevant given that in many professions, employees uh, learn through interaction with others and observation. I'll start with my first question. So I'm going to ask a question about chapter two, the whole model testing, study one. Um, for hypothesis one in your chapter two, you expect that all three types of proactive social informal learning will be positively correlated to the different employability competences. But I miss a clear argumentation for the strongest expected effect for feedback seeking. I am not very convinced when I read uh, your argumentation. Is that the case for all these employability competences that you expect a stronger effect for uh, feedback seeking? Uh, and then finally, when we look at the results, in fact, uh, it is, these are the two other forms, help and information seeking, which has a stronger impact. And so your explanation is that patterns of learning differ for experienced group, and you refer to on sales, uh, feedback seeking decreases with age. But I'm not satisfied that you just refer to on sales, because you could have checked this, whether it was the case, because you distinguish between frequency and use, so you had the data to check whether this was really the case. Uh, highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your compliments and your question. Um, let me reformulate or rephrase your questions uh, regarding study one um, about um, Hypothesis one and feedback seeking um, and my assumption that it would have the strongest effect of all the uh, social and formal learning activities or the proactive social and formal learning activities to employability competences while the results also showed something else. Um, so firstly, uh, why we uh, expected such a, a, well, a stronger effect um, given the evaluative component of seeking feedback. Right? We're seeking feedback on our performance or on our behavior in order to improve most of the time our performance or behavior. If we are seeking help, um, mostly that is because we encounter a problem or a challenge and we uh, want to solve that problem. Um, and if we search for information in general, that can, can be to fill a gap in knowledge, for example, um, but it's less, less evaluative than feedback seeking. The same holds for, for help seeking as well, as the way that we conceptualize it here in this, uh, in this study, in this thesis. So, um, and I also mentioned that in the presentation, um, I presume that that would contribute more to professional growth given the information or the feedback that you then receive of your performance or your behavior. And that, that would lead to more knowledge, for example, or different skills or different ways to develop those skills. Um, so that, that is why we expected a, a, yeah, a much bigger role for feedback seeking. Um, but that was in study one, <laughs> it was showed that it was the other way around, um, that it was hardly related to any employability competences. And, and I was thinking about other reasons that um, could lead to that result. Um, And I thought about, indeed, if uh, employees are more experienced, they are less likely, indeed, to search for feedback. So that would make sense that um, they will probably not develop that much employability competences. Um, I think it also 
goes back to the sample and that for this specific sample, people used um, the information and the help that they sought. So the other two learning activities more to um, develop employability competence such as anticipation and optimization, personal flexibility, corporate sense and balance uh, and to a lesser extent feedback seeking. But why that exactly that mechanism is taking place mm. I don't know yeah. for a full yeah. 100%. Yeah, I just wonder for frequency, for example, could you oh, yeah. see that the, the, um, the, the mean was low? Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. The mean was low, yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. And then I have another question um, related to chapter three, the qualitative study. So there you examine social informal learning of consultants who work in a knowledge intensive firm, which is a very relevant, uh, which is really relevant for qualitative study. Uh, the results are very well structured and also quantified. You also check for co-occurrences. Um, uh, you really did this reporting, you've done a very good job, I think. But what I was asking myself after reading the chapter is that there is also, I noticed the potential risk that the richness, of, by quantifying, that the richness of the data gets lost and that you do not grab really the interplay and the dynamics between these different dimensions of learning climate and these different types of informal learning. So I was wondering, so for, I, I'm going to give you an example. Eh? Mm -hmm. So you, so what we see is that the co-occurrences between learning climate dimensions and passive informal learning there you have the highest frequencies. Yeah. So, but how do you interpret that finding? So that's why, Ali, this is related to my remark. You could miss a lot of, of the interplay. Uh, and I was wondering whether a vertical analysis, so now you have done a horizontal analysis between persons, but would a vertical analysis, so within person, um, yeah, uh, offer, would this have offered you more insight knowledge about this interplay? Uh, again, thank you for your uh, compliments. Um, it was hard work to, uh, to analyze this, uh, this uh, set of data. Um, I think that with study two, we, we set out to um, study and unravel social and formal learning as a concept and the same holds for learning climate as a concept and then possible relationships between um, the two concepts. Um, we gathered a lot of data, so I also had to make a decision and structure where am I focusing on? Uh, so that was unraveling on the one hand and then looking into, okay, what are the first indicators of a possible relationship between those dimensions? Um, so some of the data, the richness, will get lost uh, in, in that process, indeed. And I think what, uh, when you were uh, referring to the example that um, learning climate dimensions were mostly related to, for example, passive learning, um, we can, could explain or hypothesize that that result is partially due to the context in which they were, uh, the consultants were working. So this. Then we come back to the context again and uh, the nature of work and the nature of organizations. Um, that these consultants um, really were working under high time pressure, reaching deadlines. Um, so the fastest way for them was to see how other people were presenting or working with the client, for example. And they didn't also want to take up too much time of the other peers, uh, the consultants, the senior, junior consultants, or the, the, the project leader, for example. Because uh, that would take uh, yeah, time to, to, to reach the deadline and um, 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 check the boxes of the, of the client uh, or the, the consultant's uh, project. Um, so that's one way how I would interpret, for example, that example that you gave. And again, I think context indeed matters. So that would be, and also the interconnectedness between the types of other learning activities and the dimensions, again, that we really have to look into the nature of work and uh, the, the, the organization's climate and culture, because that's also something that you might be referring to in the vertical analysis, that there is more in play than only learning climate, right? Um, yeah, so we also decided to measure learning climate because that was on the same level as uh, in, at an individual level, 
learning, taking, uh, undertaking social formal learning activities and then also measuring their perceptions uh, of whether learning conditions, building blocks were present, yes or no, and how that mm -hmm. would then relate to that. So it was still vertical, I know, but I do think that there's also a layer around it, looking into perhaps the learning culture or uh, the organizational environment, looking into the nature of work and how people perceived um, the relevance of performance versus learning as well. Okay, thank you, Samantha. Thank you, uh, Professor Hermdonk. The opposition will be continued by Professor Van den Bossen. Professor Van den Bossen is Professor of Team Learning uh, at Maastricht University and a member of the Assessment Committee. Thank you, Chairman. Dear candidate, uh, I'm also happy to be here and I want to congratulate you. You took us on a journey of a researcher that really wants to understand the quite hard to grasp phenomenon, but I, I, I appreciate the way you, you use different methodologies and a variety of organization you've studied to try to comprehend some of it. Um, in this defense, you already stated, I like to make bold statements. Uh, and I have two questions based on two bold statements. Of you. <laughs> um, the first one, uh, of course, I'm also interested in this phenomenon. And at a certain stage, we asked a, a bunch of medical specialists what they do if they are confronted with a problem they do not know how to tackle. And what they come up with is, uh, I ask my colleagues. <laughs> I observe my colleagues. I thought, oh, that looks like Samantha's work, social informal learning. The really social, not the one <laughs> my colleague was talking about. But they come up with other things, which may become closer to what uh, my colleague was talking about. They go and look up literature and try to see what do we know about it. They kind of look into themselves and try to deal with their uncertainty in those kind of situations. And what has struck me the most and maybe scared me a little bit, they just try out things. <laughs> we were happy to see that they were combining those strategies. So if they were just trying out things, they first talked to their colleagues, do you think this is a good idea? And they were reading about it. So, but when I read your thesis, you state, social informal learning is favored over other types of workplace learning. And then I questioned, are we in a competition? Are we? Highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your compliments um, and for your interesting question. Are we in a... No. <laughs> um, the reason why I looked into social and formal learning was because uh, most of the learning um, is embedded in social interactions if you look at work. Um, so I do think that that carries great potential to contribute to performance, employability, competence development. Um, I did not take that into account in my dissertation because of the sole focus on social informal mm -hmm. learning, but I do agree that there are different learning strategies and strategies to solve a problem. Um, and again, if I would uh, do another line of research, then I would probably look into how those different learning activities and strategies uh, follow up. Because we, for example, in study um, two, uh, again, referring back to the interviews with the consultants, we saw that they learned, for example, deliberatively, or no, a reactive in response to a challenge or a problem, and then thought, hey, but I want to solve that problem. How, what are best ways to, to tackle that problem indeed? And then they engage in, in deliberative learning, and then based in this setting, in this, in this context, they engage in passive learning activities mostly. Um, on the job, trying it out, experimenting, asking uh, colleagues for feedback. So I do think that um, we're missing an element here as well. And also the, the element of uh, reflecting about a problem that you face and ways uh, through which you can uh, uh, solve that problem. Okay, I'm, I'm happy to hear we agree. <laughs> uh, Very long answer. The, but I, I promised the second uh, one. Um, it, in chapter two, uh, and also my uh, colleague was talking about, you, you present a model. Uh, you also present it in your slides in the presentation. It goes from learning climate, in the middle informal uh, social learning, to employability. Uh, you left 
in your book, it's a little bit different. Here, you, there were just lines between it, and you were talking about relationships. In the book, you draw arrows between them. So it goes from learning climate to informal social learning and to employability. You kind of suggest some causality there, also in the way you talk about it. <laughs> and I was getting, and you also, in your limitation, you see we do cross-sectional research, and then I was already thinking when I was reading, we need to be very cautious with drawing causal conclusions. Yeah. But then you suddenly struck me, because you write, there is not a reverse relationship, as it is unlikely that employability could lead to social informal learning and in turn to learning climate. So the, the idea that the model could be working the other way around, so not the arrows, but turning the arrows around, that employability could lead to um, social informal learning, and that social informing learning could impact the learning climate, you kind of said, no, no way, that is not possible. And I was, I was looking forward to the arguments. There were none. No. <laughs> so I'm very happy to be here and ask you now, can you provide me some arguments? I will try to. Um, I was quite bold indeed in that statement. Um, and and um, I realized not too long ago that we well, could reverse the model, but based on um, the research and the line of research that I followed in my dissertation, it made sense. We saw employability competences at, as an outcome, uh, developing those competences through learning activities, which can, are hopefully supported by a learning climate. Um, but to state boldly that it cannot be the other way around um, is not really correct. Also, as a researcher, I think that there are many perhaps and maybes, and if so. Um, but, but you were saying that you were thinking differently now. So yeah, you I'm, make I'm me curious. I'm, I'm going to. <laughs> I'm, I'm, yeah, so um, what I do think now is that um, employable employees skilled employees who are able to use those employability competences in their advantage, um, that they might be, and this is a hypothesis, that they might be more likely to engage in learning to keep up that level of competence and the level of employability as well. Um, so I do think that, that um, for example, let's say a basketball player who wants to find you news in a top league uh, playing basketball and wants to find his, uh, um, I don't know, how do you call it, throwing the ball skills, um, <laughs> that they are more likely to engage in learning and, and to would, find you And would you say the same about from informal social learning to learning climate? Informal learning to... The other way. So now you're way. going from... I mean, it needs to be a short <laughs> answer, yeah. I see, yeah. from the... A short question and a short, a short answer. short question. <laughs> you said now from... Employability to informal social learning with the same lead from informal social learning to learning climate in a short way. <laughs> in a short way. Well, I do think that if you uh, engage in more learning, that you also identify more learning opportunities. And that you identify those opportunities that are part of a learning climate. Okay, I'm, I'm very happy to hear that again you agree with me. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you, President Bossi. Yes, we have two more opponents, uh, so if we can be short, any questions, any answers, that would be very nice that everybody gets his or her turn. So the opposition will be continued by uh, Dr. Gronert. Dr. Gronert is Assistant Professor uh, in Professional Development and Decision Making at Maastricht University and member of the Assessment Committee. Thank you, Prorector. Samantha, it's my pleasure to be here with you on this very special day because you deserve to stand there based on a beautiful piece of work that you have delivered. Well-designed studies, well-executed and well-written down. It was a pleasure to read your manuscript. Following the tradition of my colleagues, I have two questions as well. And I will follow Rob's argumentation a bit more by inviting you to tell me a bit more about what you think about the conceptualization of learning climate. As you know, I myself am very interested in the concept of learning culture. And in your general introduction, you state on page 13, learning culture encompasses commonly shared norms, beliefs, values, and in an organization. I completely agree with that. Uh, in contrast, learning climate refers to the perceived characteristics and behaviors in a team. And then you conclude that scholars have argued on the role of learning climate in the organization to stimulate and support professionals in engaging learning activities. Now, as someone passionate about learning culture, 
this makes me think that what you might be suggesting here is an indirect relationship, that it's not the culture that is actually driving professionals' behaviors, but it's rather the climate that they perceive individually. Given that we have a collective notion of climate that Rob was alluding to before, I would like to invite you to speculate on the relationship between culture, climate, and behavior based on what you've read. Esteemed opponent, thank you for your compliments. Um, and thank you for your uh, inspiring question. Um, that, um, yeah, it relates to culture, climate, and behavior, and um, whether I can think of ways that these uh, concepts link to each other. Um, so we chose to focus on learning climate because it was easier to measure, uh, since it was about individuals' perceptions um, that we can ask about, and learning clim or cu culture or culture in general is quite hard to grasp, and I think in your research that um, you definitely agree with that. Uh, commonly shared beliefs, assumptions, values, um, yeah, are quite hard to grasp and measure. So that's why we looked also partially into learning climate as it would be easier to, um, to measure and see if there is a relationship, yes or no. Um, I do think that um, the context or the behaviors that we show depend on how, for example, in learning climate, how we perceive learning climate to be present, yes or no, and whether that fosters uh, learning behaviors. Um, and that culture may play a role there again. And I think I'm going to refer back again to study two, in which we definitely see that there was something more to mm -hmm. the findings, right? So indeed, they perceive certain building blocks of learning climate to be relevant for learning. Uh, but then again, the context was also the culture was um, seemed to be ingrained with learning mm -hmm. and learning to perform as well. So. Um, Yeah, in that sense, I, I think that relates. But does that answer your question, or are you looking for something specific? Um, am I allowed to ask one follow-up? Short follow-up, yes. A short follow-up. Um, do you think that the relationship between climate and behavior is stronger mm -hmm. than the relationship between culture and behavior? And whether the uh, climate then could be an indirect, uh, could have an indirect effect if we look into learning culture, climate, and behavior, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, do I think the, uh, the, the effect would be stronger? I think that given that learning climate refers to perceptions and more tangible, um, and also relates to how an individual perceives the surroundings, so not so much the entire context or the entire culture, I think that would be more of an influential factor than culture, because it taps more into the level of the individual learner or the employee. But it does, it's not to say that culture does not play a role, no. All right. Thank you very much, Samantha. Thank you, uh, Dr. Gronert. The opposition will be finished by Dr. Uh, Nico, Nico Lova. Dr. Nico Lova is assistant professor at Maastricht University in Organizational Behavior and Human Resources Management. Thank you, Pro Thank you, Pro Rector. Um, dear Samantha, I read your doctoral dissertation with a great pleasure, and of course, I would also like to join the congratulations today uh, and say that you have done a fantastic work. You presented us with a really thorough um, and very well-written dissertation today. And of course, while I'm very positive and intrigued about your work, I'm also uh, curious to hear and to dig uh, into <laughs> details, perhaps. Um, of your work. So uh, very briefly, my question uh, pertains to the team structures and their role for learning. And uh, in chapter three, on page 106, you write that the consultants in this study often switch project teams, which might have hindered, team, uh, uh, hindered them to create a, a safe environment and build mutual trust among team members. I'm going to shorten the citation um, to get to the question, given the time. So even though your study um, doesn't focus on teams and team processes, um, it becomes clear that you have given some thought to the role of team characteristics, such as team tenure or duration of existence of the teams for learning. 
And so you probably have also realized that team processes and team characteristics might be important to the learning behaviors. So if you would have uh, the opportunity to collect data, which team characteristics and team processes uh, or team process constructs, uh, but perhaps also which personal characteristics that are particularly relevant to teamwork would you want to account for? Esteemed opponent, thank you for your compliments. And for the final question, I will try to keep it brief. Um, your question well, relates... You may talk as long as you want. <laughs> okay, okay. Oh, then we have time. Uh, your question relates to um, um, whether... Uh, well, you're thinking, you're, you're asking about my thoughts on how team structures, processes, characteristics, and maybe personal characteristics as well, can play a role in, in, in learning, given that, well, in study two, we saw that, um, again, context matters, the environment matters, and the teams that the consultants were working in were switching quite frequently. Um, You may finish your sentence. Oh, my sentence. <laughs> the re the remaining part of the answer is for the reception. Okay, okay, okay. I'll try my best. Um, I think um, um, building a climate in the team. I think um, I'm going to focus on that as well because I'm also referring to learning climate. That building a safe environment, um, a nurturing environment within a team would help so on a team level, not only on a departmental or organizational level, but also um, influence the way that we learn. So the, re the remaining part will be for the uh, reception or another moment of <laughs> these days. Samantha Lisa Kranz, the time appointed for defending your thesis has passed. The degree committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and your defense. I request that you and your company await the results of our deliberations and our return in this room. The PhD defense has now ended. The degree committee will debate the candidate's performance behind closed doors. This process usually takes about 10 minutes. Got my laces tied, long road, I don't waste no time. Break rules because faith decides. With the team and we chase the light. I make a move, fall down, shake it off. I hate to lose that branch, break it off. No room for negativity, praise and love. Prepare for deep park, cause we're taking off. Get the mileage,
the south side. Seven miles in my rearview mirror. I know what it felt like. My goal's only getting clearer. East side to the west side. No place like home. If this question's how you've got, go the extra mile and not. I'm going to the south side. Seven miles in my rearview mirror. I know what it felt like. My goal's only getting clearer. East side to the west side. No place like home. If this question's how you've
ze niet vallen. Oh, dan, dan ga ik gewoon keihard lachen. Ja, dat ligt er wel. Het is toch tof. Voor jouw moment, hè? Huh? Dit wordt echt jouw moment, hè? Ja, even niet worden. Niks, gewoon genieten. Loslaten. Zo, dit deel van de zitting en de ceremonie gaat in het Nederlands. Samantha Elisa Krans. De commissie hier aanwezig heeft zich beraden over de kwaliteit van uw proefschrift en de wijze waarop u uw proefschrift heeft verdedigd. Op grond van haar positief oordeel en gelet op de examens die u vroeger heeft afgelegd, heeft zij besloten u het gevraagde doctoraat toe te kennen. De hoogleraar. Uh, uw promotor, professor Bozaar, is gemachtigd u op de gebruikelijke wijze met deze waardigheid te bekleden. En het woord is nu aan uw promotor. Samantha, belooft u dat u altijd voor ons de beginselen van wetenschappelijke integriteit te werk zult gaan? Eerlijk en zorgvuldig, transparant, onafhankelijk en verantwoordelijk? Ja, dat beloof ik. Kracht is de bevoegdheid ons door de wet toegekend. Volgens het besluit van de commissie heer tegenwoordig verklaar ik u hierbij, Samantha Lisa Krans, tot dokter te bevorderen en u alle rechten te verlenen die daaraan volgens wet en gewoonte zijn verbonden. Ten bewijze hiervan overhandig ik u nu de bul door rector, secretaris en overgeleden van de promotiecommissie ondertekend en met het grootzegel van de universiteit bevestigd. Het woord zijn de promotor voor de laudatie op. Beste dokter Krans, beste Samantha. Met veel plezier feliciteer ik je namens het begeleidingsteam met het behalen van de dokterstitel aan de Universiteit Maastricht. Ik weet zeker dat je collega's van, van uh, Universiteit Maastricht, je collega's van het Staff Career Center, meer specifiek het UM Sports Center, en het departement Education Research and Development, maar ook je familie en vrienden net zo trots zijn als wij dat je vandaag je promotietraject hebt afgerond. Laat ik beginnen met te zeggen dat je proefschrift in vele opzichten buitengewoon is. Niet alleen vanwege de uitstekende kwaliteit, maar ook vanwege de unieke weg die je hebt gevolgd, de weg die je hier vandaag heeft gebracht. En die weg licht ik graag nader toe. Beste Samantha, voor de oorsprong van het proefschrift moeten we terug naar het academiejaar 16-17. Dat jaar studeerde je de master Management of Learning, vandaag Learning and Development in Organizations genoemd. En daar kwam je passie voor mensen en hun leren, het leren en ontwikkelen van mensen, meteen bovendrijven. Ook je interesse voor onderzoek werd aangewakkerd toen je voor een tweede keer een masterthesis ging schrijven. De eerste thesis schreef je binnen de Master Work and Organizational Psychology, ook aan deze universiteit. Het werd al heel snel duidelijk, naar aanleiding van die thesis, dat je een PhD ambieerde. En net op dat moment, dames en heren, was er een PhD-plek in ons departement voorhanden, die we maar al te graag aan jou gaven, gegeven hoe het schrijven van die masterthesis uh, was gelopen. Het officiële startschot voor een mooi PhD-traject was gegeven en je zette je schrap voor bloedstollende ervaringen en uitgegiende ups en downs. Je nam een blitse start, want je masterthesis werd snel gereviseerd en niet veel later gepubliceerd, niet in het minste journal. 
De eerste publicatie van je proefschrift was een feit en er zouden er nog drie volgen. Niet iedereen doet het je na. Iedere studie publiceren voor je gaat verdedigen en in wat voor een journals. Die andere artikelen die bouwden netjes verder op je eerste publicatie en lieten je toe om de concepten leerklimaat en werkplek leren steeds verder uit te diepen. En laat dit net een talent van je zijn, Samantha. Zaken tot op het bot uitzoeken en dat vervolgens heel netjes gaan uitschrijven. Je begeleidingsteam was steeds weer onder de indruk van je conceptuele denken, de manier waarop je methodologische en statistische skills eigen maakte, ook het kwalitatief onderzoek bijvoorbeeld, en je schrijftalent. Soms zat je weer even op een paragraaf te broeden en vervolgens kwam er een hele vlot geschreven tekst uit rollen. Je maakt ons leven als promotor wel heel makkelijk. Voordat ik nader inga op je onderzoeksproject, wil ik graag vermelden dat Samantha al heel snel deel werd van het departement. Want samen met haar collega en partner in crime, Wendy Nuis, werd ze een drijvende kracht, zowel binnen onze opleiding als de afdeling. En al toen je student was, organiseerde Samantha zomeruitjes voor ons, voor studenten en docenten. We gingen met z'n allen aan powerkick doen. Ik moet bekennen, ik had er daarvoor nog nooit van gehoord. Maar ik kan je ook zeggen dat ik het nog dagenlang geweten heb uh, dat we aan Powerkick gedaan hebben. Puffen en zweten terwijl Samantha bleef lachen. De spierpijn na afloop om nooit te vergeten. Datzelfde jaar werd je ook het gezicht van de opleiding. Want je nam een promotiefilmpje op voor de opleiding, die te pas en te onpas werd bovengehaald. Op open deurdagen, Google Ads, Keynotes. En ik gebruikte je iedere keer opnieuw als een voorbeeld van een high performer. Als je wilde weten hoe het kwam dat Samantha het zo goed deed als PhD-kandidaat, ja, dan moest je de opleiding Learning and Development maar komen volgen. Want daar zou je leren wat high performers precies doen. Eenmaal werkzaam bij ERD gingen we op hetzelfde sportieve elan verder. Samen met de collega's stretchoefeningen doen aan het einde van de gang voor 20 minuten, of je het nu leuk vond of niet, om er vervolgens dan weer in te vliegen. Want er werd wel heel hard gewerkt. Nogthans maakte COVID-19 het je niet makkelijk. Je kon net iets minder conferenties meepikken. Ik herinner me de ontgoocheling toen de AERA in San Francisco niet kon doorgaan. En toen je contract afliep, was je proefschrift nog net niet helemaal klaar. Maar gelukkig vond je een warme thuis, niet zo ver van je oorspronkelijke huis ERD. Je vond een plek bij het Staff Career Center, waar je L&D-expertise heel goed van pas kwam. Je kon er met collega's, onder meer Anne, Sylvie en Bas, de Leadership Academy uitbouwen. En ondertussen werd er rustig verder geschreven aan dat mooie proefschrift. Zo ontpopte je jezelf tot een gewaardeerd expert op het gebied van inzetbaarheid, informeel leren, leerklimaat en leiderschap. Sta me dus toe terug te komen op je onderzoeksproject Understanding the Social Side of Learning. Je proefschrift bestaat uit een reeks van vier onderling verbonden studies over hoe leerklimaat in een organisatie het sociaal leren van werknemers beïnvloedt en bij gevolg hun inzetbaarheid. Je onderzocht dit door middel van kwantitatief en kwalitatief onderzoek in verschillende settings. Het geeft nieuwe inzichten in hoe het leerklimaat nu een rol speelt voor dat sociaal leren, Rob, en competentieontwikkeling. Um, je proefschrift toont L&D-professionals hoe ze kunnen interveneren in de praktijk en zodanig leren en inzetbaarheid meer kansen te geven. Je geeft toekomstig onderzoek ook een duw in de rug door een vragenlijst af te leveren die hopelijk door veel onderzoekers gebruikt wordt in de toekomst. Beste Samantha, nu is het tijd voor nog meer sporten. Powerkick bijvoorbeeld. Sportles geven bij UM Sport. Wandelen met de hond. City trips. Uh, altijd welkom in Brugge. Human interest. Boeken lezen. En filmpjes volgen. Wijnen. Een nieuwe baan als learning and development specialist bij APG. De collega's van APG hebben echt wel het groot lot gewonnen. En natuurlijk Rico. Want... De afgelopen jaren waren misschien niet altijd makkelijk. Zo'n PhD lopen, we weten allemaal hoe het gaat. Er zijn dan ups en downs. 
Maar jij ging er altijd weer voor en daar zit jouw Rico ongetwijfeld voor iets tussen. In naam van het begeleidingsteam wil ik jou, je familie en vrienden van harte feliciteren. Geniet en nu is het tijd voor feest. Dr. Samantha Lisa Krans, namens de Universiteit Maastricht en namens de School of Business and Economics feliciteren wij u met uw behaalde dokterstitel. En met een verme hamerslag mag ik deze zitting beëindigen. APPLAUS